Hey, thank you so much for being here today. Isn't it great to be able to be back in person with each other? Isn't it good? I want to say two quick words about things uh, before I get started. One is um, thank you so much for praying for my wife, Shara. Uh, she is at home. She is doing better. Uh, still is a ways away from being where sh uh, she wants to be. But thank you for praying for her. And I would pray, ask you that you would continue to pray for her. Uh, the second thing I want to say is um, about this class that I'm going to do uh, on October the 18th at 6.30, this gospel in action. I hear a lot of people say, you know, I really wish that I knew how to engage with somebody and to be able to share Christ with somebody in the public arena, where, whatever arena that might be. Uh, if you will come on that night, give me an hour and a half, I'm going to teach you how to do that. I would love for you to come and be a part of that. So you can either go to our church app or you can go uh, to our website and sign up. So make sure that you do that, okay? Uh, I would love for you to be a part of that evening with us. You know, uh, at some point, uh, every person here has to decide if we are going to conform to the society around us. So in other words, are we going to cheat on our taxes like other people do? Or are we going to cut corners in our business like we see so many other people do just to get ahead? If I'm going to participate in gossip with other moms, if I'm going to deal with relationships, how God wants me to deal with them, if I'm going to cheat on my spouse in the workplace like I see many others do in the workplace, if I'm going to allow my kids to live in sin and not call them out on it because the norm is not to ever call your kids out on anything. If as a teenager or a college student or a single adult, once I'm involved in a relationship with somebody that I like, am I going to be involved sexually with them because it's something that's almost required of me and society says it's okay? Okay. So what am I going to do when I have to just make decisions on what I'm going to do around me? We started the series last week called Unshakable. It's about this person by the name of Daniel. If you've got a copy of God's Word, I'm going to be back in Daniel chapter 1. I would invite you to turn there. But we're going to see today how you remain to be unshakable in a world that pressures you to conform to what they're living. And as we, we started this last week, we talked about this amazing story about this guy by the name of Daniel. And the story starts when he's 15 years old and it ends when he's 85 years old. The story has more adventure than any big screen movie that there will ever be produced. And so let's review a little bit from what we talked about last week. At this time, Israel has fallen into a moral, spiritual decline. And God's pretty upset with Israel. And in 586 BC, God allows the most powerful empire at the time, Babylonia, who's led by King Nebuchadnezzar, to take Israel captive. They destroy their capital city. They take 25% of their people and they take them to Babylon with them and they become prisoners of war. And during this time, Daniel is one of those guys that are taken. It is a story from rags to riches. I mean, you're talking about a guy who is separated from his family and his own homeland, but at the end, he saves an empire. He becomes the second most powerful man in all the world. And during this time, we see how God tests Daniel. Now, I'm going to give you two thoughts about how God tests us. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you, is that when God begins to test me, <coughs> excuse me, when God begins to test me, I just want to say, God, are you sure you got the right address? I mean, I think there's somebody who needs a test a lot more than I do. Go to somebody else's house and test them. None of us like testing, but it is something that God will always do. So let me give you two truths about testing, all right? So here's the first one, is that, you cannot have a testimony without the test. Anytime that people talk about what God's done in their life, it's because of something that God has brought them through. The second thing I want to say to you is this, is before every blessing, 
there's always testing. Now, see, that's not us. We want the blessing without the testing. Amen? That's what we want. But there's always going to be a testing before, before a blessing. And every time that God tested Daniel, he passed the test. Not only did he pass the test, God gave him more influence. He gave him more power. But don't miss this. He gave him more insight. John, the apostle John, and Daniel are the only two guys that God ever told how everything was going to end. Everything that Daniel predicted in the book of Daniel has come true. So when people come to you and say to you, you know, I just don't believe that the Bible's true. Well, you can always go to Daniel and go, well, everything that Daniel said has come true except for the second coming of Christ. Everything has taken place that Daniel said would take place. And then last week we talked about three concepts of being shaken. And so today I want to talk to you about how we stand against social press pressure. Now, once again, Nebuchadnezzar is a king. He's taken 25% of the population. He has taken them hostage. And his goal is to take the teenagers. His goal is to take the teenagers and to brainwash them. Now, we talked last week about there's three things that come against us. And it's, it is the world, it is our own flesh, and it is the enemy, the devil himself. So you couple all that together, that's what we have to deal with. I want you to know, just like Nebuchadnezzar, and that he was trying to brainwash teenagers, it is exactly what our society is doing to us today. As a matter of fact, I would even tell you, it's not just the teenagers, it's to every adult as well. They want to brainwash you. They want to brainwash teenagers. And the way that Nebuchadnezzar did it to Daniel and to all those people he picked, he wanted to wipe out the memory of Israel. In other words, he wanted to wipe out the memory of God. In other words, you don't need Jehovah God. The other thing he wanted to do was to wipe out, to wipe out the law of God. Now, that is a picture even of the New Testament church today in our society. Most people that go to church on a consistent basis, if you ask them what truth is, truth is merely relative. It's for whatever you want it for in the moment. Truth is not truth. And you see, when you are able to come to the point to where it's to where you don't believe in absolute truth, another thing's going to happen to you. You will become spiritual lazy. You're not going to do really anything for God. You don't want God to use you because we're more consumed with the world around us. So during this time, Daniel, tests, Daniel passes all the tests by living out three qualities. Now, I want to encourage you to take some notes today. And we're going to talk about these three qualities. Here's the first quality is integrity. He never forgot who he was. <coughs> and Daniel's motto was this. You can change my address. You can even change my name. But you're not going to change my heart. Paul wrote about this to the church at Rome in Romans 12, in Romans 12 too. And I would even tell you, as we look at Romans 12 too, I would tell you if you don't have Romans 12, 1 and 2 memorized, memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. Here's the verse, Romans 12. Paul says to the church, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, there are two choices that all of us have, and it's not but two choices. There's not an in-between in ground here. There's one or two ways we're going to choose. We're either going to choose to conform to the world around us, or we're going to choose to be transformed by the power of God in our life. And let me tell you, you're not going to be transformed by the power of God unless you are in the Word of God. So you need to ask yourself, am I allowing the Word of God to transform my own life? Because if we're going to choose to be conformed to the world or transformed by the power of God, I will tell you this. If you will choose today, if you walk out of here today and just say, I'm going to choose to be transformed by the power of God and by the Word of God. If that would be your heart, I can promise you that you're going to know God's will for your life. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be days where you struggle and you question, but at the end of the day, you're going to know what God's will for your life is. But if you're going to live a life 
of being conformed to the world, I will promise you, you are going to miss God's will for your life. Now, let me just really be transparent with you here. I'm not really sure why, but Thursday morning I got up, when I got up out of bed. Have you ever had those mornings when you got up and as soon as you got up, you thought, oh my gosh, I feel like the devil is on my shoulders. I feel like I just can't get a thought. I'm going to tell you, I struggled more with my thought life on Thursday than I have in a long time. I can't tell you why. Maybe I could tell you some of the reasons, but I really don't know why. And I'm going to tell you, it didn't just start, and I just went, okay, okay, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to prove what God's will is, perfect, pleasing, and good. I, it wasn't that I could quote that verse and go, oh, boom, it happened. It, it's, it's over with, and now I... I all feel good. I felt awful all day long. I couldn't get a good thought in my mind all day long. I have no idea what it was. I know some of you might be saying, well, you need to think more positive. I was trying to think more positive, but I just couldn't get a thought. So I don't know where you are today, but I would say, if you want to be a person of integrity, You've got to live your life to say, I'm going to choose to be transformed by the power of God and not to conform to the world around me. I want you to look at what it says, all right? And uh, we're going to read a whole lot more of this, but uh, I want us to just stand as we read together in honor of the reading of God's Word. And we're going to read Daniel chapter eight, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. So can I invite you to stand with me as we read in honor of the Word of God? <clears throat> It says, but Daniel resolved not to defy himself with the royal food and wine. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in the, in the second quality. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, if you've got a hard copy of God's word, I will tell you to circle those two words, resolved not. Underline it, circle, put a star around it, because here's what you got to understand. For, da for Daniel, when he, he resolved not, this was not an external thing for Daniel. It was an internal thing. He had, no, he had no parents around telling him, you need to do this. He had no friends telling him, you need to do this. Because he was in love with God and because he wanted to walk with God and he had an integrity, he said, before it ever happens, before you ever came up and I ever became a prisoner of war and I'm not around my family anymore and I, I'm never going back to my homeland, he didn't even know that at the time, but he says, I have resolved not. You ought to put that up in your house. You ought to put that in your car. You ought to put that in your locker that I have resolved not. In other words, when the time comes, I've already decided. It's not even a choice for me. I have resolved not to define myself. Now here he's talking about food. We'll talk about that. But it is in every part of his life. So I would encourage you that today you would walk out of here today and you'd say, okay, I really want that kind of integrity that I have chosen. I'm choosing to resolve not. Pray with me, all right? God, I pray that you would teach us things today. And, oh, Spirit of God, would you speak loudly to us? Spirit of God, speak to me while I even deliver the word today. God, I pray that we wouldn't walk away, Spirit of God, of what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name that we pray and everybody says amen. Have a seat. Thank you for standing so, when we talk about resolving not, let me give you just, let me give you an illustration of how this works, okay? It might be that you're in middle school, maybe you're in high school, maybe you're way out of high school, but you have somebody, and all of a sudden, you meet somebody through social media, somebody that you see a picture of, and you go, hmm, I think I might be interested in that. That, that's pretty good right there. I think I'm interested. It's amazing when I talk to teenage guys and they talk to me about who they're dating. And I'll go, well, so who is the girl you're dating? Well, we've been talking a while and, you know, I think we like each other. And I go, oh, well, have you been on a date? Well, well, kind of, sort of. And I said, well, what, I mean, what does that mean? Well, have you been anywhere? Well, no, we're just texting. Dude, you ain't been anywhere with anybody. You're just talking on a phone to somebody, not even talking, just texting with, with somebody. And so what happens is, is that, and let me tell you, don't get all wigged out that I'm going to be up here and go, oh, you should never, ever meet your mate online. 
I just wish I'd have been smart enough to think, think of that, okay? And that I would have created that. Because I know a lot of people that have, they've gotten married and they met somebody online. But I will tell you, if you're going to do that, make sure you got some boundaries in place and make sure you got somebody in your life that's holding you accountable with some things. But anyway, you meet somebody. You meet this person. And, and you say, okay, man, we like each other. We, we like each other. We, and we think, you know, that, that we're going to fall in love with each other. And that, that's, that's going to happen. And yet what happens is, is that the only thing you know about the individual is a picture you see or something that, they have, that, that they've topped out for you, that you're reading or something about the individual. And so then what takes place is that both parties are either on a computer or a cell phone or iPad or something, and they read each other's words. But what happens is after the words... It takes on life because behind the words is a real person. And then it moves from that and it becomes emotional. And now they meet each other and everything changes because now all the words take on a new meaning because they are abiding with each other. And then all of a sudden, you hear they're getting married. And I'm going to tell you, as a minister of the gospel, <laughs> get, getting to marry people when people walk down, I mean, I have looked at the groom and I have said to him, you realize that she will never look better than she does right now, right? This is the best she's ever going to look. And I want you to know, ma'am, that from this time, he's probably going to become Mr. Grumpy in your life, all right? So just so you'll know that, all right? It's not the way you look, you're not going to look any better. But all of a sudden... They begin to date. Everything changes. Why does everything change? Because they have moved from just talking online. Now they are abiding with each other. God is a spirit. You can't see him. But what he has done is that he has given you words to live by in a book called the Bible. And so what happens to most Christ followers, they never understand this thing about being what God wants you to be and being transformed, being transformed because we continue to conform our lives to the society around us. And yet when you begin to abide with God, now you begin to fall in love with God because now you're just not knowing some concepts about God. Now you've moved from just hearing some things about him. Now you're abiding with him and you are in his word and you are hearing what he has to say to you. So you have to decide. Am I going to be transformed or am I going to be conformed? The reason that Daniel was transformed was because of his integrity. He never forgot who he was because he was always abiding in the presence of Jehovah God. So ask yourself, am I doing that? So here's the second quality. is discipline. He controlled his appetite and his ego. Now, don't get all wigged out because some of you are already ahead of me. You're going, oh, gosh, good. I came to church, and he's going to talk about my bad eating habits, all right? I have to talk about that a little bit because the whole Scripture is about it. But there's a whole lot more that goes into it than just this thing about how you eat. But in Daniel 1, now, it's a little bit lengthy, but we need to read all of it, all right? In Daniel 1, starting with verse 8, all right, through verse 21, all right? So let's read together. Here it is again. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king. In other words, he's afraid of Nebuchadnezzar, all right, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king... The king would then have my head because of you. You get the picture, right? I'm going to die if you don't eat the food I'm giving you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, at this point, you're thinking this guy's crazy, right? I mean, you're asking for water and vegetables when you could have the best food around? Then compare our parent, our parents with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. 
So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now, before we get to verse 17, let me just say, what, tell you what's going on here, okay? There were dietary laws for the Jewish people, and they could only eat certain things. And Daniel wanted to honor God in this way. And so when they brought him, obviously they brought him things that were not honoring to God. And so there were these dietary laws, and he was, no, I, I don't want this. That's the reason I'm going to eat. Will you just let us have vegetables and water? No, if I do that, my king's going to have my head on a platter. No, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. Okay, well, then just test it. Now, let me just go ahead and tell you this. If you want to see how you confront somebody in authority, go back and take some time and read all these verses, and you'll see how so masterfully at the age of 15 that Daniel did this. All right? So here we go. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal, none equal, nobody close, none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter, every matter, of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So when you look at this right here, he's 15 years old. He's taken by force from his country. He would never see his parents again. He would never return to his homeland again. So here he is. He's in, now get this, he's 15. He's in a foreign country. There is no parental supervision. And the guy that has more than anybody in the entire world at the time steps up to him and goes, you know what? I'm going to give you the best of everything. I'm going to give you the best education. I'm going to give you the best food. I'm going to give you money. I'm going to give you the best entertainment. I'm going to give you the best everything. So just think of it this way. You're 15 and you're a boy and you're at Panama City Beach, Florida. And this joker walks down from his mansion and says, you know what? I'm going to give you the best of everything. There's no parental supervision. You know what Daniel that says? No, thanks. Matter of fact, he says, I'm only here because I don't have a choice and God's put me in this place. Even though that he was there, he would never be indebted to Nebuchadnezzar. He wasn't going to conform to him. He would not be seduced by him because I am not one of you. I am not in your camp. I am with Jehovah God alone at the age of 15. You wonder why the next generation is so important. Here you go. Look what it says in Romans 6.13. Paul writing again to the church at Rome. Do not offer, what's those two words? What? Say it again. Any part. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourselves to him as an instrument of righteousness. See so you know what he says? He says, I want you to be disciplined. Now, hang on for just a minute here, okay? Um, you know, <laughs> six years ago when I had my heart attack and they said, you know, make sure that you eat healthy. I said, I do eat healthy. Make sure you work out. I do work out. Well, if you'll work out and you'll eat healthy, I promise you your heart's going to do good, okay? Well, good. Then five years later, congratulations to Phil. I got two more stents in my heart, all right? And so I want to go, my gosh, why did I worry about eating crazy chicken breasts? I could have had steak, you know? And I, did, I chose, why in the world did I not eat Krispy Kreme donuts? I could have done that as well. But here's what nobody will ever be able to tell me. That because that I was disciplined, how many more years of my life do I have here on earth? Because I was disciplined with what I ate and with working out. And so I'm going to tell you, for some of you here today, you need to hear this. Your eating habits are killing you, but not only your eating habits, but the fact that you don't work out because 
God's given you a heart to keep in shape. I know you're looking at me right now going, you have gone to meddling now, all right? Can you just keep moving on here? Okay, I'll keep moving on. Let's talk about your own devotional life. How disciplined are you in that? I mean, teenagers, do you just get up in time to get to school on time or do you take time to spend time with God before you go to school? Adults, do you spend time with God before you go to work? And I know if you've got young kids, that's a tough deal. I, I get that. Maybe it's at night time, but are you disciplined in that? Are you disciplined with your financial life? Are you disciplined in your relationships? How disciplined are you in your marriage? In being intentional with communication with each other? Are you disciplined with your dating life? You see, when I have no spiritual disciplines in my life, I can't say this for anybody else, but I can say it for Phil. When I'm not disciplined, can I tell you what will drive me? My ego. I think God owes me something. I'm just telling you up front, that's the way it is for me. And I would say to you, do you think this was easy for Daniel? He had nobody. He had three buddies with him. That's all he had. They were about the same age as him, what history tells us. He had nobody. He didn't have a parent looking at him going, you know what? Man, I'm praying you spend time with God. They were probably praying for him. They weren't around. So just as adults, are we, are we disciplined in what we need to be disciplined with? You know, let me illustrate this way. When, uh, when I tested positive for COVID, uh, they told me, they said, okay, once your fever is over, let me encourage you to get out in your neighborhood. If you, if you can do this without being around anybody, get out and walk. So I did that. I went out and walked. I'd walk, I started out walking 20 minutes, and I got up to working 30 and work, walking 35. Friday was another kind of day. Friday was a day I went back to the gym for the first time, and can I tell you how much pain I was in on Friday? I mean, I'm like, this is no fun at all. I don't even like this. I, I mean, can I just give myself an excuse just to go home and lay around? I don't even want to work out. I mean, I am so, I, I, would, I would lift, and then I, all of a sudden I'm going, my gosh, I, I'm having to stop just so I could get a breath here. I mean, <laughs> this is no fun at all. Can I tell you, any time you choose to be disciplined with any part of your life, there is always pain involved in that. It's just going to happen. So I would encourage you that to be disciplined, and it is going to be painful. And let me just tell you this, is that, is that when I think about being disciplined, I, I want to tell you that there's some things in my life that I'll talk to you at the very end about, boy, some really key things for me in my own life to be disciplined. I pray that you walk out of here because you're not going to be transformed by the power of God in your life and you, until you choose to have some spiritual disciplines and to be disciplined of every part of your life and make that your goal. And if you mess up and... You don't meet with God in, in the morning or in the evening for two weeks. Pick it back up. Don't quit. Keep going on. So here's the third quality. The third quality we see is courage. He was willing to stand alone. Man, let's be honest. It's tough to stand alone in the society that we live in. For the next generation and even for adults. Can I tell you, there's constant media pressure. There's constant technology pr pressure. It's not just killing teenagers, it's killing parents as well. The more choices that we have at an early age. I mean, folks, we've gone crazy in our country. In some school systems at the, the level of third grade, they're teaching sex education. That is mere craziness. The hopelessness of the future. Very few times will a parent ever look at a kid and go, okay, I know you're getting to college and we talk about what you're majoring in, but let's talk about something even more important. Where do you want to be 10 years from now spiritually? We hardly ever talk about that. We ever hardly even look at our spouse and go, where do you want to be two years from now in your life spiritually? We never talk about that because we're so consumed with our culture around us. We live in this get it now syndrome. Kids are growing up without the ability to deal with pain and, and, uh, and delay and denial. Now, this is not a family series, but it's a great point to make here. How many times have we said as parents, well, I want to get it for my kids. I want to give them something I didn't have. 
Have you ever just stopped to think for a moment that the reason you turned out so well was because your parents said no? We don't do that. We give them the best. I, I get it why we want to do that. But can I tell you, when your kids grow up, can you imagine what that's going to look like in marriage? It's a part of the training. It's a part of having, having the courage and being willing to stand and, and call some things out. Daniel allowed God to decide what truth was. Daniel didn't decide what truth was. He allowed God to do that. Are we doing that? Or we just said, no, I want to choose what truth is. If we're going to have this courage to stand alone, we have to allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives. And that means that in every test that comes our way that we say to God, God, I'm willing to stand. If I have to stand alone, I want to do that. I want to be this man or this woman, this teenager, a single adult. God, I want to be your person. I want the Spirit of God to work in my life. I want to have the courage to stand and even to stand alone. Oh, my gosh. What if somebody makes fun of me? The best thing that can ever happen to you is for the right people to be mad at you. You're welcome. See, no, we're so bent on, even as adults, being in the groups. Why? Do you see how Daniel has stood out? And as we progress through the book, you ain't seen nothing yet of what this guy does. So how do I start? How do I pass the test? How do I do what God wants me to do? How do I stand up and to stand alone? How do I have the courage to do that? It's one day of purpose. I'm all about future goals, but for this day, this day, today, on Sunday, whether you're watching online, whether you're here in person, I am choosing to be what God wants me to be. I want to be transformed by the power of God on this day. I'm choosing for this day. Go back to Daniel 1, verses 18 and 19. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. None was found like them. So as I close my time with you, I want to give you three things to pray for. I want to give you three things to pray for. I want to give you three things. I want to encourage you to, to do three things as well. Here's the three things I'm going to ask you to pray for. Number one, it's a real basic thing. But before your feet hit the floor, number one, thank God for the cross. Without the cross, you don't have the ability to know, to know truth. Without the cross, you have no idea what even redemption looks like. If it's not for the cross, we get hell at best. Can I get an amen? So thank him for the cross. Number two. The second thing I'm praying for, ask for a passion for God. Simply put, God, would you give me a passion for you? And the third thing is this. Ask God to surround you with some people that love God and love the church. I'll talk a little more about that here in just a second as I close up with what to do. So here's three things that I would encourage you to pray for. Here's the three things that I would encourage you to do. Number one, choose to be disciplined with the basics. It's amazing every time that I ask somebody about their own devotional life, and that's, I think that's the most basic thing there is just about loving God with your life is making sure that you're in the Word. Stop and just ask yourself, okay, last week, how many days did I spend alone with God in His Word? So choose to do that. Choose to be disciplined with the basics. Now, let me just say, when I talk about the basics, is that there is a spiritual discipline in my life. And oh, I wish I could, as your pastor, tell you, you know what? I do it all the time. And there's not really a reason for me not to do it all the time. I will also say to you this morning that any time that I'm doing this discipline, my prayer life is completely different. Not only is my prayer life completely different, my life is different because I see things with the right perspective. And I stop and ask myself, okay, why, why would you ever quit doing this? Hang on, I'll tell you what it is here in a second, okay? I'll tell you in the third thing I'm going to ask you to do. So number one, choose to be disciplined basic. Number two, choose to stand today. It might not be an issue today. 
Because you might not be going anywhere, but at your workplace, choose to stand today. Stand for God. Don't be embarrassed about that. As a teenager, as a college student, as a single adult, as, as a married adult, make sure that you are standing for God. And the third thing is, number three, get with a group. Did you know something about Daniel? He had three buddies with him. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because that's what their names were changed to, to give them Babylonian names and not, not let them keep their Hebrew names. But he had three buddies. They were in a group. And you'll see as time goes on how they continue to stand for each other. Let me tell you, okay, this right here, get with the group. I cannot tell you how important that is. Let me go back to that spiritual discipline of my life. I meet with six other guys on Wednesday morning at 630. We have a curriculum we do, but also when you come to the table, everybody has to have a scripture verse memorized and everybody has to say it out loud. And let me just tell you, <laughs> if, you ain't, if you don't have it, oh, you, they're gonna, everybody's going to give you heck, all right? So you better have thick skin if you're in our group because if you don't have it, everybody's going to make fun of you. They're going to make fun of your family and everybody else too, all right? They get everybody, okay? And so... You better make sure that you have your verse memorized. And I can, I can tell you that even when we all come together, we spend a little time in the cur curriculum, but the main thing that we spend time with is saying our verse and what that verse means to us. You know why? Because the verses are changing our life. You know what your life would look like if you did nothing but get in a group of two to three people and you did two things, pray with each other and memorize scripture. You know what your life would look like a year from now? Your life would look completely different. People wouldn't even recognize you because of the way that you think and the way that you, the way that you carry yourself. But see, we don't want to do that because that's not really important to us. It's not, to, and it's not even different for your pastor just because I preach the word of God. For my life, if I want to have victory, if my prayer life is rich and my prayer life is strong, it depends on me knowing the word of God. So I'm going to tell you. Get with the group. And let me say, don't choose 10 people. Because you choose 10 people, you're going, somebody's going to get angry. You know why you're going to get angry? Because eventually four out of the 10 are going to show up. That's usually what always happens. Get two or three with you and just make it your goal. I'm going to, we're going to pray with each other and we're going to memorize scripture. If you just did that, do that. Get with the group. So, to review the three qualities, he had integrity. The second quality, there was discipline. The di discipline with, with everything in his life. And the third quality, he had courage. I don't know what the Spirit of God has said to you on this day. But I sure pray that you have allowed the Spirit of God to speak to your heart. And so here it comes, is that now that the Spirit of God has spoken to you, you have to choose to do something with that. Whatever he said to you, obey him in that. Oh, I pray you would do that, church. I pray that you would, you would, you would open your heart to allow God to do some things in your heart today.